Hello, listeners, and welcome to Drax Part 2, the second and final episode in our Drax informational series. If you haven't listened to Part 1, please go back and do so now, because a lot of the information presented in the following episode will probably not make sense to you. In Part 1, we discussed a first story then delved right into the Drac origins, first writings, and role in history, as well as their nature and physical characteristics and abilities, Drac magical characteristics and abilities, their habitat, homes, and relationship with other fairy folk, and finally, their relationship with humans and how to find, interact, trap, lure, or repel them based on said relationship. In part two, we will be discussing a second story, then analyzing that story and what the drac represents in humanity and how the magic of the drac can manifest in or apply to our everyday lives and perspective. Then we'll be talking about my personal application or manifestation of this magic in my life or how it could be. So without further ado, this is our second story. The following story is largely based off of the version found on mythicalcreaturescatalog.com. Go to this website to find more. Once, long ago, a young woman had gone down to the river to wash clothes when a glimmer in the water caught her eye. Some say she saw a golden ring. Others, that it was a golden chalice. But whatever she saw, it wasn't for the taking. And as soon as she reached out to take her prize, she toppled over into the water. In the river, she was easy prey convulsing and thrashing about, and her captor expeditiously dragged her to his lair, a cave deep beneath the river. The formation of rock was shaped just so, allowing for a pocket of air that enveloped an ample ledge carved from the rock. In the cave, she screamed, but they were already so deep that no one heard. The woman felt a pressure on her ankle, though she still saw nothing. I am the drac, he rasped. Then the drac cast a spell that made her forget her life, her child, her husband, and her home. For the drac had brought her to his cave, not for food, but because she was a nursing mother and the drac had seven hatchlings in need of human milk. They lay there on the ledge, mewling as though tortured and wriggling their scaled bodies among swaths of wrinkled cloth. Without memories, the woman soon accepted that feeding and caring for the drac's hashlings was her only duty in life. And every day, she would feed the hatchlings from her breast and rub clay from the bottom of the river into the young dragon's eyes. 
The clay had been brought by the Drac himself, and having magical properties, it allowed the hatchlings to see their father, who was invisible to everyone else, even the woman. One day, the woman accidentally brushed her eye after applying the sediment onto the baby Drax and got some clay into it. Surprised, she discovered that she could see the Drac with that eye. For seven years, she stayed in the cave, remaining silent regarding her ability and performing menial tasks for the Drac. Finally, when the young dragons didn't need her anymore, the Drac carried the woman back to the surface. He laid her on the malleable mud of the riverbank, among the pond reeds, and, cunning as he was, before letting her go, the Drac reversed the memory spell. Now, the woman had no memory of the last seven years. She would perceive that she had just fallen into the river, then swam back out. Long after the Drac departed, the woman remained sitting in the mud, feeling the warmth of the sun for the first time in seven years. She began to grow anxious that her child wasn't there, soon bolting upright in a panicked frenzy and running home, where instead she found a bearded man and a grown boy, none other than her husband and son. Both of whom thought she had been swept away and drowned years ago and for a moment they didn't recognize her. For seven years in a den caring for a brood of dragons had taken a toll on her. She was no longer young. Her hair was dusted white and her skin was sullied and frail. But before long, the man embraced his confused wife and they began to ask her what had happened. She had no answers to give, and after a few days, the husband resigned himself to not knowing, simply happy to have his wife back. All was seemingly normal. The woman was happy looking after her adult son, cooking, and working in the lavender fields. Until, one day, when walking in the marketplace, she came upon the Drac. He was scrabbling along the side of a shop, leering at the children with a ravenous grin as he toppled flower pots and ripped curtains. Suddenly, the memories of her seven years in the cave came flooding back, and she screamed. The drac cocked his head towards her and strode across the market. Can you see me? He hissed. Yes, she said. Then when she realized the idiocy of her statement and tried to run, before she could escape, the Drac slashed her right eye, effectively blinding her. It was only in her right eye that she had rubbed the magic ointment. So, without that eye, she could not see the Drac anymore. She could not see him, but she remembered now. And for the rest of her life, she walked the streets of Bucher, half-blinded and babbling about invisible dragons 
who snatch children for food and maidens for milk. But the people ignored her, believing her crazy, and the children continued to vanish. Story and Creature or Fay Analysis The Drac is such an eclectic creature who is depicted in a multitude of different forms, ranging from an invisible dragon to a small water sprite with an affinity to wooden plates to a purple orb. In all forms, the drac embodies different aspects of human society. The notion of invisibility can be defined as literally not visible, or it can represent actions or individuals that exist without being noticed. The idea that a dragon is waiting in the shadows could be a metaphor for the subtle dangers we encounter in everyday life, acting as a warning that even benign and welcoming places, as well as people, can hide under a pretense of safety. There are roughly 32,000 reported cases annually of missing adolescents and children under the age of 18 in the United States, 51% of which are a result of strangers or an acquaintance. Rape, abuse, suicide toxic relationships, sex trafficking, and domestic violence are all traumas that are often shrouded in silence. So, there are many forms of Drax that thrive under the protection of invisibility. And perhaps, this story is beseeching us all to be wary of them. If you feel that you are a victim of any of the aforementioned crimes, please talk to someone or call the National Assault Hotline 800-656-4673. Anyway, the various forms the Drac assumes, including the golden chalice and ring, are also symbols of fertility and matrimony. These mirages additionally appeal to the greed of humans, illustrating our yearning for gold and wealth, and how this incessant need can sometimes consume us, like the river. listeners if you have made it this far we have now reached my personal magic section where i will talk about how the drac relates to my life or of somebody my age so first of all i think it's accurate and insightful that dracs penalize people for their insatiable longing for gold. We are way too obsessed with this material, or at least the idea of this material. But also, I think we all have our own wants that can be consuming. And this creature is a good reminder to review that. Currently, my greatest want 
is for things to go back to the way they were before the pandemic. But it'll be a long time before, if ever, life can even assimilate what it was before. Another thing that resonated with me was that Drax target children. My mom always warned me never to trust strangers. Never go with anybody I don't know personally. Nobody has a puppy in their car. Nobody wants to show you where your mom is if you're lost. All the typical advice. Though, it is also my opinion that stranger danger is overused. Since most child abuse and assault crimes derive from incidents with family members or other adults who are close. So, members of our family and people we feel that can be close, we also need to be wary of. That doesn't necessarily mean we can't trust anybody, but I, I'm not going to go around telling you who to trust. I'm just saying that it's likely we shouldn't completely not doubt everyone in our lives, even those that we think we know. A lot of girls, especially my age, can also feel invisible and do many unnecessary things in order to either make others like and pay attention to them, or so that they can feel more normal. Because sometimes, outwardly, being a nobody or a follower is a method of safety in a social environment that is foreign or uncomfortable, like middle school. So that's how I think I feel the Drax would apply to my life, particularly their ability to become invisible. In summary, Drax are invisible water dragons that are either able to transform into or create a mirage of a plethora of different creatures and inanimate objects, ranging from a minuscule water sprite skating on a wooden plate to a jeweled chalice. They prey upon children for sustenance and young women of reproductive age whose milk they require to feed their young. Drax reside in enchanted cities or caverns beneath the rivers of France and will imprison the women they capture in such abodes for seven years after which point they return them to their village. That's all for our episode on Drax. Please leave a rating and review on whatever podcasting source you are listening to this from. And feel free to shoot me an email at ourveilofsmokinggold at gmail.com. Regarding any concerns, feedback, suggestions on fairies, or anything else you want me to know. I appreciate any critiques on the podcast so far, as well as corrections if you find something that's wrong. I am not feigning being an expert. I am simply not an expert. So please, contact me if you feel the need. 
it's also just nice to hear the voices of anyone spending the time to listen to me because it's invigorating and gratifying to know that I'm being heard, which is more than a lot of people my age can claim. My sources for this episode include The World Guide to Gnomes, Fairies, Elves, and Other Little People by Thomas Cately. I'm quite sure I didn't pronounce that correctly. But also, The Fairy Bible by Teresa Mori. Mermaid Monday, The Very Strange Tale of French Drax, an article at visitcryptoville.com. Drac, an article at mythicalcreaturescatalog.com. Scientists get closer to creating real-life invisibility cloak, an article from CNN. And Agneta and the Sea King by Helena Nyblom. If you were looking for supplemental material from this episode, um, good luck with that because it was really difficult to find bona fide articles or as genuine as you can get when you're researching mythical creatures on Drax. So unless you want to go down an internet rabbit hole that leads to some very strange things about refrigerators, just use one of the aforementioned sources. This is Annalise on Our Veil of Smoke and Gold podcast. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you next episode.